Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and our weekly Thursday throwback rerun. This week we're going to be going all the way back to October 2011 to my ninth video I ever uploaded. This was back when I only had seven subscribers. Now back in the day it did get about 28,000 uh, views uh, which was pretty good for me uh, but I will say that you know four or five years later I took it down and I'll explain why in a second so it isn't even searchable anymore and the subject of this video was draw boring now I still do my draw boring the same exact way but I will tell you the gap filling trick I show you in this video is something I now do on a lot of different joints especially my dovetails if I might have a lot slight gap in one area this is an excellent way to fill them up it's also kind of fun looking back because this video is over 10 years old and i'm still using the same tools including the same drills the same little gauge uh, alls i made that kind of stuff just look in the background it's kind of fun to see how much i've hung on to over the years and for a little inside baseball this video is also a great example of how early YouTube was such a Wild West environment. Uh, I Again, you cannot find this original video on YouTube anymore because I took it down. I actually got a copyright strike on this, a copyright claim on that, excuse me. And that's where somebody will say, hey, you used my music. I used about 20 seconds of a techno video game beat at the very beginning of the video. They say, you use that music. I didn't give you permission to use it, but I'm going to let you continue to have this video available on YouTube, but I'm just going to keep all the money that you earn from it. Now, granted, this video only earns like 10, maybe a nickel a month. Well, here's the thing. It was a ripoff. Basically, back in the day, you would go to a website that had a list of music, and you would find a song and artist that you liked and get permission to use that video. A lot of times artists would just give it away for free only that they ask that you copy paste a little permission or you know credit in your description and do something in the video to acknowledge them. They were just getting their name out. And I used those kinds of free things at the very beginning. Well, two, three years later, some scammers figured out that they could go to those websites, download every single piece of music, cut a second off the front, a second off the back, and maybe speed it up or slow it down to make it longer or shorter, and then upload those new files up to Google or YouTube and tell Google, hey, I think people are stealing my song. It is your responsibility to scan every single video ever uploaded find the ones that had this song in it or even a five second clip of that song and then file a copyright claim on that one and i will let those people continue to use my song if i get all the money again you collect a nickel 10 cents from a bunch of different people it adds up well i get this little notice and google saying hey you can leave the music at the, the video out there we'll just get the money to this guy I do my research because I know I wasn't, hadn't done anything wrong, I hadn't stolen. I go out, I find the original song, I find the original permission, I even contact the original artist and say this is what's going on. And I do my appeal. You click your button, you fill in the forms and you explain, hey, it is quite obvious that this person has the original file. It was uploaded three years before I even uploaded my video. The guy putting the claim has said he created the file two years after I uploaded my video and it is quite obviously he clipped it and he sped it up. Google, this is a false claim. At that point in time, and this is actually still the same rule to this day, Google will go back to that scammer and say, hey, these people have proven that you stole this th claim. Do you want to release your claim on his video? Of course the scammers are going to say no. No, keep giving me the money. Well, they, Google go back and say, hey, they're going to keep getting the money. They still say it's theirs. Your next step is to either go through 
some stuff that's going to cost you money. Arbitration, legal fees, that kind of stuff. Again, you're only earning five, ten cents on this. Most people are just going to say, just leave it and give them the money. Basically, Google became the henchman for these scammers. And I can see them just doing an automated bot, just hitting a button and then thousands of songs being done that way. Me personally, I just deleted the file. I didn't want to deal with it. I felt kind of ripped off. I will say, even though that's still how it kind of works to this day, Google at a later date did go buy a bunch of songs and say, hey, creators, just use these songs. There are also other companies that if you pay a hefty fee, they will defend their catalog, which probably just means that they have an inside with somebody at Google that will say, hey, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it, which is why, you know, creators of my small scale, a lot of times you'll hear the same music on a bunch of different videos. It's just all we have available to us. <laughs> anyway, that's just a little inside baseball of how the Wild West was somewhat won. I hope you enjoyed this video on Draw Boring. Okay guys, I have a bit of a problem here. This next week, I've got to turn all that into three display cases I can carry around on top of my Mini Cooper. So they've got to be lightweight. So I'm going to be doing a lot of mortise and tenon joints. As such. Here's my problem. In order to make these joints stick together, You've got to use a lot of clamps. You've got to be coordinated enough to put them in. And you've got to be patient enough to let, the dry, let them dry. I'm none of those. I'm too cheap to go buy more clamps. That's all the clamps I have. I know I'm not coordinated to get a huge display case with you know a couple hundred clamps all lugged up. And I'm not patient enough to do that. So I'm simply going to use a technique called draw boring to cinch up all these. Grasping the concept of how a drawbore work isn't that complicated. Basically, you have a mortise and tenon joint. You drill a hole all the way through the mortise side, reinstall the tenon, and then mark that center of that hole on the tenon. Then when you drill the hole through the tenon, offset it a little bit towards the shoulder. That way that the holes don't line up perfectly. Now when you drive a peg through this hole, it will cinch the shoulder of the tenon onto the mortise and lock it in place. The pressure inside the joint will keep it tight for years to come and you can go right back to work. You don't have to wait for the glue to dry. So let's try one out. The first step is always marking out where your your pins need to go. Uh, typically you on a small joint like I have I'm using in this example you only need one but I'm working with two just so I can do it twice in the demonstration. I always 
use my little scratch hole to make a divot for the hole because I tend to use brad point bits because I like the fact that that center point will go the hole in the it, I know I'm going to drive drill a hole in the right spot. I also like to use some kind of backer board behind the the piece so that I know I'm not going to have blowout on the back end. Right here I'm just using a piece of uh, scrap poplar and I've got some blue tape on my drill bit to make sure I don't drill in my bench top. Next, fit your tendon right back in. And because I'm using a brad point bit, whenever I push it into the hole, it may leave the slightest of dimple at the center point. This is important because the next step we are going to mark a spot to drill a hole that is a little bit closer to the shoulder. Now typically when I do this, I'll stick my scratch all into the existing hole, I'll push forward and then drive down. This typically offsets it, you know, a sixteenth of an inch or a thirty second. Not very much. On this example, because I want to be able to show it in the pictures, I am driving the holes a little bit farther towards the shoulder than I probably should. But it all works out. It's no big deal. Next step, just drill the holes in. You want to follow that by simply reassembling the joint. Push it in as far as you can, but don't worry if there's a little bit gap or if it's not as tight as you could with a hammer or clamps because the drawbar will take care of that. And when you look through the hole, you will start seeing this crescent moon on the very top. In my example, it is overly exaggerated. Now, a lot of people, including Mr. Schwarz, will recommend using a drawbar. This is the first time I've ever used a drawbar pin, and I'm not 100% sure I did it correctly. These pins that I got from Lee Nielsen are tapered so that they work in all different size holes, and supposedly the idea is they will round over the tenon a little bit. Your next step is to put a point on all your pegs. This is how I typically did it instead of using the pins because that point will follow the curves. And after that it's just a matter of sliding it in and pounding it down. Don't worry if it looks like the peg is angling because it is working its little way around the curve so it's going to have to angle a little bit. Just pound it in. Uh, I like to do it against some kind of backer board or into a hole drilled in that backer board because sometimes you will get blowout on the back side without that if you just do it into like a bigger uh, dog hole on your bench. Uh, you just have to be a little careful on that one. So just drive down the pegs. Notice I don't have any glue on these right now and they are never coming apart again. Now, I know these are supposed to be disassembled, but I've never been able to take them apart. They are locked down. Now most people, when they're done, will simply flush cut the pegs off and maybe sand them smooth for Cosmax reasons. Uh, I'm, I'll show you a quick trick to make them look a little bit better now. Uh, now on this first one I drilled flush. Some people will leave them a little bit proud, more like the green and green style and round it over. But notice when you do it this way, see the gaps around the edge? Those won't ever go away, and if you just fill it in with a little sawdust, people can tell. So this is how I get around those gaps showing up. I saw off my pegs a little bit proud. Notice that th these two have huge gaps on them. I did them on, chose these two on purpose. And then I will grab a little baby uh, medicine injector, or like a syringe thing, fill it with water, and drop a few drops of water onto the end grain of just the pegs and then let it sit a while. That water will flow down through the peg. It expands a little bit but not too much. And more importantly, it will soften the grain a little bit. Then take off all the excess water because you don't want it fl flying everywhere. Then I will grab my small hammer. It's got a dome on it on the end. That allowed me to control where I, I hammer on it, and then I just pound away. Now, please remember, these joints have no glue on them, and yet they are not going to move. This is kind of like riveting metal. It will spread the wood out, and that wood will fill the gaps. And it will actually make it a little bit tighter also. So I just pound away for a little while. And it's kind of cool if you touch it right now. Well, not while you're hammering on it. That'd hurt. 
the metal the wood actually is a little bit warm and then I will use a chisel to pair off the end it'll give me a very nice finish after that you're done you have a joint that's not coming apart no clamps required I went ahead and sliced one of these joints open so you could see how the mechanics work. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and tell your friends. Remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Be safe and have fun.